This video is about the Rochester fire story I did at ABC News Channel 20. And this story is one about all of the character building cliches of having a good attitude, being resourceful, and also wanting success more than anybody else wants it for you. All long ways of saying that you're self-motivated. And if you're watching this video, you are. And this story is the one that changed my career. And more though, it's the story behind the story that changed my career as well. After all, what you're looking at is just a regular house fire. Now, it's sad to say, but when we talk about news, it's the truth, because you're gonna go on many of them. And this particular story took place in a place called Rochester, Illinois, which when you look at a map is only about 10 minutes from the station. But at the time this call came in, about 6.15 p.m. You might need to double that accounting for traffic. So the point of telling you that is because I had just gotten done doing a live shot in the newsroom. And at the time that I was stepping off the wooden box that we all stood on in the middle of the newsroom, a shot like this from a different story, but these are what those shots always look like, I and my managing editor both heard the dispatch call over the scanner for the fire department to send what it could to the supposed house fire. And again, it was 6.15 and at that time, all of the photographers would hide out either in their cars or somewhere behind the station so that nobody could find them. So my managing editor gave me that look, the, hey, would you be willing to go check that out? See if it's a big fire like this caller is telling the dispatcher that it is. And I knew that nobody else would do it and I was curious myself. So even though I was right at the end of my shift, I went to go check it out. And truth be told, as I was driving around the area to where we had been told, or at least the scanner was saying that this fire was, I couldn't find it at first. But then all of a sudden, as I came down a hill, I saw this huge plume of smoke and I knew, whoa, yeah, there's a fire and this is gonna be a big deal. So here's the package. We're gonna play it through. It's really short and then we'll break it down. It's just chaos. I mean, there's a dozen fire trucks here and hoses going everywhere. And... We started attacking the fire. We banned the roof. The fire, we believe, was above our heads the whole time in the attic. Smoke. That's about it, that's all you can see. Nobody was in the structure, nobody was home at the time of the structure. It was called in by a passerby, I guess, or a neighbor, one or the other, we're not sure. Well, when we first saw it, I thought it was uh, Kate's bait shop. We called in Chatham and Divernon for manpower because of the heat. Even our firefighters are getting hauled off by ambulances. We took one to the hospital and uh, the rest of them are just getting cooled down. I, uh, I know we're running 3,000 gallon tankers, and I think they made a couple rounds. It's going to be a total loss. Deep stakes are in there. It's all their possessions are all in there. And uh, it is, it's their home. Overhaul tonight, overhaul this house, make sure the fire's all out. I feel pretty bad because, you know, it's someone's, it's someone's house and they, you know, live there and raise their children there. So that's pretty awful. There's a lot to unpack here. First, I mostly stayed on the street. I don't like shooting on other people's private property, mostly because it's illegal without their permission and I didn't have it. Plus, to get these shots, I didn't have to be on their property anyway. There was no reason to go there. And three, if I had encroached even just a little bit, I would have gotten in the way of the fire department that's trying to save this home and that's never good. Once I shot all the things I heard randomly making sounds, which you always want to do first because typically you've got one shot to get those because they usually go away. So things like the fire trucks, the hoses, sometimes the men and women going inside. You've got to get that in real time when it's happening because those moments never come again. So once I did that, I started to look for, well, I got my action. Where's the reaction? Is there anybody watching all of this go on? And of course there were. There were plenty of people. And it turns out that there were some neighbors who were actually willing to talk to me. They had been watching it almost since the beginning and were very interesting to talk to. 
So now I've got action, I've got reaction. Now all I need is to talk to the fire department to get the official report of what they think professionally happened. I've got eyewitnesses telling me, hey, this thing went on fire and it got really big. What I want to know is, what is fire investigating? Only the fire department can begin to even tell me, well, what was the cause of the fire? When did the call come in? Was what the caller said actually what you found? And in terms of this house as a home, is it a total loss? Were you guys able to save it? And sometimes the answer is no. And for this story, the answer was no. One more thing about this story in terms of trying to get this official sound was that the official we needed to talk to was inside the fire trying to help put it out. So we had to wait for him to come out. And with that, please know that the story took place in either June or July and therefore was still hot and humid even for Illinois. And fires like this get so hot that firefighters are rotated in and out about every 15 minutes to prevent heat exhaustion. And that's why this one firefighter was taken to the hospital and they were fine. They were taken out of an abundance of caution because I think they had just slightly fainted and that could be signs of heat exhaustion or even two smoke inhalation. And again, they were fine, which is very, very good. Also keep in mind too, their oxygen tanks only carry so much oxygen, so they have to rotate out of the fire anyway. So now back to the sound. I believe this gentleman is the lieutenant chief or the assistant chief, and he couldn't talk until around 8 p.m. And when he did, he was great with us. But now, after having gotten him, I've got at least a 20 minute drive back to the station to get this on the 10 p.m. news. And this story was definitely a package and not just a shorter Vosad or even a VO. And the reason I bring that up is because I called my producer on the way back and told her that I had good stuff. And she told me she only wanted a VO. I'm like, oh, heavens to Betsy. And you will be in this situation as well. So I really sold the idea of a package and told her how good quality of video I had how people will, and again, I know what we're talking about here, like people will want to see this. People will be like, whoa, that, that was a crazy fire. So I really pitched a package hard, selling to her what I really had. I had great video. And you've seen it. And compared to regular news, is shot better than what you see every day. She told me she was tight on time, but then also asked, all right, how long would you need? thrilled that there was an opening and being a producer myself, I knew that she was tight on time. So I asked, all right, how much do you have? And she said, I'll give you a minute. I said, deal. Raced back to the station, keeping within speed limit laws. <laughs> and during the rest of my drive back, I had to figure out in my head how to get this package on the air by 10 PM because I would walk back into the station physically into the station around 9 or 9.15. So the most I would have is an hour. It turned out to be that 9.15. So I had 45 minutes. Plus, this is back in the day when you shot on tape and had to ingest that tape in real time. So if your tape was a half hour, it would take a half hour to get into the system. Cameras with memory cards like we know today would not be adopted at that station for at least one to two more years. So here's how I did it. As I've talked about before, if the story is good and I need more time in it, I will be the first to cut myself out of it. I will first cut the stand up and if I need to, I will strategically rewrite voiceover tracks to make them shorter to make way for more natural sound or a sound bite. And the package that you saw is what is called a natural sound package because the only audio that you hear is the natural sound or somebody else talking. The only way you know what reporter or photographer put this piece together is because their name will be in the anchor intro. That's it. There's no out cue on this. There's no live shots. It's a nap package. And making it a nap package saved me so much time 
there was no script to write, and I didn't have to voice it, and then lay my voice onto a timeline, and then B-roll that. My order of operations was this. Start ingesting, then write the anchor intro so the anchors knew at least sort of what they were going into, and then on scratch paper, I wrote out an outline of the script remembering what the chief and the neighbors told me. And I wrote just above that where I wanted what video, and it was easy to remember because one, I just shot it, and I'm watching it ingest. So I know by way of time code where it is. And that is how I got this to air. There was a 10 p.m. version, and then I added in some shots that I didn't have time to edit for the 10 p.m. version in the morning show version. And all in all, the piece was a 105. Five seconds over the one minute I was given. But the producer, she didn't care. She was thrilled with the story. And I gained a lot more respect because I really had the video that I told her I did. I didn't exaggerate. I had the goods and I delivered. And that's how you build trust with your producers, with anybody in your newsroom. When they see your work ethic, how well you communicate, they'll come to respect you because not many people in your newsroom are willing to do either one of those things, let alone both. And one last short story about the making of this entire story came the morning afterwards. A reporter that had watched me run into the station and watched me make this deadline the night before asked me in an interesting tone, why did I choose to do the story that way? The exact quote was, why did you go that route? Basically what she was really asking me was why I myself was not branded anywhere on such a good story. It doesn't have my voice, there is no stand up, and of course my name doesn't pop up in the package itself. And I simply told her that that was the only way to get this on the air. And if that meant cutting myself out of the story, then yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And she had never heard this before and actually, much to my surprise, respected it. She had never heard this before and thought it was pretty cool. And it's all humbling because when your stories influence others, teach others at your station, it means that you're doing all the right things. And the story, of course, did go on my tape and it did impress all the news directors who saw it. So please, let this be an example to you that all of these skills and strategies work. And of course, make good stories that get a news director's attention. And with that, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. I'll see you in the next video.